You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Barbell Logic podcast, Beast Over Burden. I'm your host, Nikki Sims. And I'm your co-host, Andrew Jackson, Chief Operating Officer and Product Manager for Turnkey Coach, Mm -hmm. as well as a Strength and Nutrition Coach. I also do Client Experience in HR at Barbologic. It's good times. Coming at you with some Q&A today. We have some questions. We're going to give you some answers. We've decided to pick three. We're going to go with three questions. Okay. All right. I'm imagining, by the way, this, I believe, is coming out the day after Christmas. So everybody's in the post-Christmas lull hanging out, hopefully with friends or family, presents abound, new goggles and (laughs) what other fun things do people normally get clothes? Micro plates. Ooh, yeah. Adjustable dumbbells. New gym equipment. Knee sleeves. That totally reminds me. I just forgot. I went on a (laughs) gift buying blitz. I had like an hour (laughs) to shop between some commitments. I don't know why I'm being weird about that. I have to pick up. I mean, like work and picking up your daughter yeah basically (laughs) randomly obscure (laughs) comment but anyways i had an hour and i went on this ridiculous shopping spree i don't even want to look at the credit card Mm -hmm. statement right now but it's all been wine apt for Mm, lovely shout out to my client jesse meekham founder and former ceo anyways the gym equipment comment just reminded me of (laughs) wow what were we talking i completely forgot that i got that is hopefully arriving here in the next day or two so you got yourself some adjustable dumbbells? No, it was a gift that I purchased for someone that shall remain nameless. Is it for me? No, it's for Oh, I was going to say. Lara. Oh my God. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> is this how you're telling me about it? Oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> Didn't say anything specific. <laughs> there may be a package from Rogue that arrives today oh or tomorrow. God, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> While we're recording. <laughs> You're so great. Okay. okay. Let's dive into these cues. Here's one from Bill. It's about jujitsu. Okay. As a 43-year-old washed-up meathead getting mm. close to a blue belt in jujitsu. Congrats. How did you approach training change once you got there? Do you try adding new things into your game or focus on refining what you have become proficient with? It seems almost as overwhelming looking down that road as it was when I first stepped out on the mats. So I think we have two questions here. If I pretend to be a 43-year-old washed-up meathead getting close to uh, a blue belt, which I, I'm pretty similar to. Yeah, close enough. So how would we recommend he approach training once he gets his blue belt and then looks like some jujitsu related questions? So, Coach Andrew. Well, I remember you talking about this vividly right around the stage that you were towards the end of being a blue belt, but roughly, I guess, the same idea that I remember you talking about the difference in your mentality between competing versus training on the mat, which I'd heard you talk about is that it was a relief when you were, maybe I should just let you tell this story or I'll remind you of this story. (laughs) I have no memory (laughs) files. You felt a sense of relief going into a competition to not worry about needing to remember a hundred different things and to just Yeah, that was when I was about to compete as a white belt, my first competition. And as a white belt, you're definitely like kind of overwhelmed with all the things that you can do in jujitsu. Jujitsu is an amazing art. Like there's so many different combinations you can form, so many technique options you can employ and refine. And as a white belt, you're definitely, you feeling like you're drinking from a fire hose and you only know a few things. Like you're new, you're usually a white belt for like a year, depending on how frequently you go, maybe more, maybe less. But getting ready for a competition, like you said, it was my professor, Jeff, at the time who said, don't try and do new things, do what you're good at. Right. And that was like, oh, like you said, it was such a relief. I was like, cool, I'm going to put them in a closed guard and then I'm going to triangle them or I'm just going to choke them out with their own gi. And that's what I did. Yep. And it worked. So when you're a white belt, like you just have so much to learn. Bill, you said you're getting ready to get your blue belt, hopefully. And at that point, you're just going to keep learning. Like let your professor, your instructor guide you on the technique of the day and pay attention to how you're moving. Like 
don't try and know it quickly. Think of all the ways you have learned to get into that technique, get out of that technique, and just like be kind of pedantic with it on, okay, how does the collar need to be pulled? How am I positioned on the floor? And just pay attention to like the little pieces of it. I think that would be really helpful because you do feel like you need to learn so much and you want to skip ahead to the coolest variation of that movement. But like the basics that you learn in white and blue belt will carry you through all the way to a black belt from what I understand. Talking to friends of mine who have their brown and black belts, like the basics can really go a long way. And attention to thoughtful movement and detail is also really important. And you learn that from day one. You can learn that from day one. I also remember you at one of your later competitions. I think it was one of your last blue belt competitions. You did a move that you didn't have in your plan, but you just recognized at that point, you recognized the opportunity to apply something. And it was, it wasn't necessarily like the game plan, but it was a move mm-hmm. that you saw the opportunity to apply in the moment and did it. Yeah, you kind of just have to go with your instinct. Yeah. And, and when you're practicing at your academy, you're building those instincts. And when you're really thoughtful and paying attention mm-hmm. and being present, which is one thing that I love about jujitsu is right. you can't There's be nothing else. else you can focus on. <laughs> you're able to more rely on those instincts and don't overthink your way through it and just go with that. But as a blue belt, I remember blue belt, you just really think you need to prove yourself and you're really proud of getting your blue belt. And often you can be real spazzy and you're just going at, you know, RP a thousand all the time. And it's okay to be patient, not hurt yourself, (laughs) especially as a a 43 year old washed up meathead. (laughs) Yeah. So I'd say pay attention to the details and don't be afraid to get really good at the basics because you can be an annoying purple belt who's always just getting someone a triangle. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, it's totally overwhelming. But also one cool thing about jujitsu is that you have so much time. You have so much time to get better at things. You know, it takes a long time to level up to get your belt. But appreciate each belt that you're at because you never get to go back and it, you kind of only get more and more pressure and anticipation the further you get so have fun in each level that you're at cool oh, jiu-jitsu is fun question numero dos this one's from brent on ooh, that's about nutrition he's a truck driver i'm a truck driver and it's really hard to keep with macros especially now that i know how much i need with training with barbell logic is counting macros so important that it should be top priority or is eating clean and watching the junk i consume enough that's a great question this applies to so many people being a truck driver that definitely has a level of complexity of food availability that definitely deserves to be weighed into this the two questions were are counting macros the top priority is counting macros so important that it should be top priority i don't think counting macros needs to be the top priority i do think nutrition is an important variable in the process of strength training. And I would imagine as a truck driver, there's a few logistical challenges around having good choices that are available and balancing your energy needs with what is mostly sedentary work. That's my imagination. I've never been a truck driver, but that's just what I imagine. You're sitting and driving most of the day, so you don't have access to your kitchen and you're probably eating at a lot of restaurants potentially and can't get a lot of fluids in because you're going to have to stop otherwise you got to stop yeah so you can't do liquid calories that's probably limitation so i wouldn't say counting calories is a priority but i would say having a strategy for getting an adequate amount of protein and managing your calories is pretty high priority if you're not getting enough protein or calories you're not going to be able to progress on your strength training very far. Yeah. And if you're getting too much, depending on your preference, I mean, you could always err on the side of eating too many calories if you want to prioritize getting stronger. The trade-off there is that you're going to be putting on more body fat. So I would say the level of priority of counting or managing the fidelity of the amount of calories that you get is dependent on your goals and the amount of energy that you have, time and energy you have to work on it. If I were personally in that situation, so a lot of it would depend on the quality of the options that you have along the way. I don't know what the stops are. Like if you're literally stopping at truck stops yeah. and ordering a at a good cooler greasy in your truck. spoon. Yeah. 
you know, you certainly, if you're eating at a restaurant, are going to have no problem getting enough calories. Probably going to be getting, on average, too many calories, especially if you're trying to keep your protein up because the protein options are probably going to be relatively high fat. Just always find the grilled chicken sandwich or the salad that you can add meat to. Yeah, those are First probably thing good I options. On the menu. If you have the time, the recommendation that I would point somebody in that situation to is something that I've seen from Stan Efforting. When he's traveling, he pre-cooks his meals and then puts them in a thermos. So for him, it's like a monster mash. So it's ground beef and rice or potatoes and some sort of vegetable. The reason he does that when he's flying for whatever business or competing, whatever, he'll pack literally like five or six giant thermoses that are full of monster mash. Thermos, not a Tupperware, a no, thermos. A thermos so that it stays hot. Oh, So he gets to eat okay. hot meals through a full day of training. That's nice. Right. Yeah. And he's eating three, four, five, sometimes six meals a day that are broken up. Yeah. And so, if, you know, literally imagine a giant thermos full of Monster Mash. If I were a truck driver, I would try to find a way to do something like that. You know, to reflect the question back to Brent, I would say how much of a priority is your strength training and your body composition? If it is a very high priority, then I would recommend taking the time to prepare your meals. And if you don't have the time to cook it or the you know, wherewithal or the, the ability, then I would get pre-made meals. Get something like a trifecta or a... Factor. Yeah, factor meals. Look up whatever the options are that you have. I would go something along those lines. Yeah. It's a good opportunity to control what you can control. And for you, that might be, okay, on the first trip out from my home, I can prepare this many meals that will last this long. And then, okay, I know I'm going here next. What are my... And just find the options around you. Like yep. preparing ahead of time will like... It'll either let you know that the options are great. You'll have somewhere to go. The options are slim. It'll help you go right to the place that you know you can get to or that the options are like pretty bad. And even then you can prepare to, you know, have more calories at that time or need to supplement protein in a different way. But like don't go in blind. That is like stressful because you might be hungry and more likely to just be like craving something and make a decision that maybe you didn't really want to make. My go-to, I still don't count calories when I'm traveling, but the couple of hacks, I guess, that I use are to look for options that are relatively high protein. More and more often, protein shakes are available. Granted, we just talked about not getting fluid calories, but check the label and try to find something that's got at least 20 or 30 grams of protein, ideally 40 to 60 grams of carbs and no more than 20 grams at most, maybe 10 to 20 grams of fat on the label. That's probably going to be a decent snack or meal to grab. But, you know, that's not necessarily counting calories, but or macros, it just kind of gives you something to aim at. Yeah. And if you have to count one, it sounds like protein's a really good one to count. Yes. And then fat's the second one to have like a read on. Yeah. Protein for this question, I would say prioritize protein. Yeah. That's probably the highest priority for somebody who's strength training. And I would imagine then it becomes a matter of managing total calories, whichever way yeah. fits given the constraints you have. And you asked like, is eating clean and watching how much junk you eat enough? And that can actually make a huge difference if you're coming from eating habits where, you know, processed food and junk intake is high. But just to switch from eating, you know, more single ingredient foods that are higher in protein, limiting how much junk that could make it really big difference already. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to tell whether his problem is getting too many calories or not enough of the right kind of calories. Again, imagining being in a truck all day, the tendency to snack is probably pretty high. And to your point, I would agree that not snacking is probably going to be helpful. But in order to do that, you're going to need to replace with more intentional meals. Yeah, it's a good one. Wish I had a little bit more context because it seems like an interesting problem yeah, to, to solve. Yeah, fun. <laughs> Very open-ended question. I'm going to ask one more question that came in from someone on Instagram. So this one is for you from another Andrew. <laughs> oh, hello, Andrew. <laughs> I want to know how many pants Mr. Andrew Action Jackson has blown out in his life and if he has any memorable stories featuring a pants failure. <laughs> <laughs> I have lost count. I would say it's got to be somewhere north of a dozen I don't know, something on that. Wow, that's a I, lot of pants. Yeah, definitely a lot of pants. I'm trying to think of memorable pants. 
The most memorable pants splitting story is from a wedding right around the time that I was doing my LP and go mad. So it was peak linear progression. And I think I ended up doing some sort of like Russian leg kick move on the dance floor and totally exploded the pants. <laughs> but more funny was the next day I looked down at like found my pants mm -hmm. and then I had sweat so hard. Oh my god. I actually have a picture of this. That there were salt <laughs> stains, like encrusted. They were black dress pants and it was just like covered in salt. Andrew loves to dance at so weddings. sweaty, just head to toe soaked with my crotch blown out <laughs> that these pants had to be retired. It's not pants related, but I would say it's probably the most well, certainly the most professionally embarrassing blowout was that I was in this executive meeting reviewing metrics we do every month we did and I was in a chair I had probably just had an entire chicken I used to buy the <laughs> hot chicken you know like I have they have oh, like sure. the pre-cooked chicken rotisseries, rotisseries yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'd probably just eaten one because I would I had a tendency to do that for lunch because these meetings would go all day long I was at peak girthiness. Uh, <laughs> I think I was, I was pushing 280, which for anybody that's been in the corporate environment, the ideal executive kind of activity for, you know, perceptions purposes is like triathlon, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. cycling, marathon runners. Like that's what all the CEOs and presidents would do. So to be the big 280 whole chicken eating guy was not exactly, it didn't exactly fit. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I'm sitting in this, you know, corporate looking office chair and leaned back and there was just this <laughs> crack noise. And next thing you know, my feet go no! straight up in the air and I'm on my back. Your chair broke. Chair exploded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So room full of all my peers, <sighs> boss, you know, and everybody's Your just looking at me is like, on the line. there's big power lifter, Andrew. Har, <laughs> har, dar, dar. <laughs> so I would say that's probably the most memorable thing that I blew out. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Many pants squatting, but nothing really other than just like, well, there goes another pair. Yeah. Good thing you bought all your pants at Costco. Uh, Kohl's. Oh, Kohl's. Kohl's. Kohl's cash. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Kirk Cousins. Yeah. <laughs> the Kohl's cash. Yeah, those are the pants that are like always on sale. Oh, yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. if I always buy my pants 40% off, are they actually 40% off? Or is that just a marketing Asking thing? some big questions right now. <laughs> <laughs> the Matrix is going to get me. Do you have a question for me? What's your training objective at the moment? A training objective at the moment is just pack on muscle. Continue muscle to pack packing. on muscle without getting hurt. Okay. Which I have just a couple of hot spots. My shoulder just seems to be really persistently wanting to be annoying. So I kind of am at a point where I need to just be careful around my shoulder. Funny thing about my shoulder is if my shoulder hurts, I can't sleep on my right side, which is pretty much the only side I can sleep on and be able to breathe and not hurt my back. <laughs> Lovely. Getting old is fun. So yeah, I just want to keep putting on muscle because that seems to me to be the gateway of activity to keep being able to do activities that I love and to be able to regulate body fat and keep having a big butt. So that's my goal. Thanks. <laughs> is there anything that you have learned over the course of 2023 that has influenced your training and or coaching going into next year? Man, I was just, yeah, thinking on that topic. I was actually just talking to my friend slash coach about this yesterday. It has become very challenging in what I'm doing right now to not have a rigid dogma that I can like articulate and yell about. And it seems like that was an easy way to be loud on social media and be loud in certain ways and just be like, this is the right way. If you're not doing it this way, it's not the right way. This is why you should be doing it this way. And I know I have principles that drive my coaching and drive my training, but they seem to be a lot more fluid based on the person who I'm working with. Mm -hmm. Strength founded, but I have a lot more open-mindedness to which variations of lifts that I use based on 
injuries and goals and where we're coming from and where we're going. And I still feel grounded that it's strength-based and largely heavily, like heavy strength training, but not having that like, this is right, this is wrong kind of mantra has been kind of a challenge for like being salesy. I'm like, I'm leading the Barbell Logic online coaching part of the company. And while I do believe that it's the best way to serve our clients is to make it client-centered, it's challenging to have a voice that stands out in the marketing world. Yeah. So that's been an interesting thought that's just been bouncing around my head a lot lately where I'm totally invested in helping people live a high quality of life and how strength supports that. But that doesn't sound like internet fighting words. Right. (laughs) We talked to that social media expert and it was interesting to hear how you have to be one extreme or the other or you get ignored. If you try to explain things with nuance or middle of the road, yeah, it gets no attention. You need to be more dogmatic. I had the same conversation with Jesse Meekum. Mm -hmm. He said reality is you have to just be dogmatic about something yeah to stand out and that's also i think that's come up like when i was lifting really heavy frequently it was easy for me to like this is just one vein that i also noticed in it was easy for me to post on instagram all the time this is what i'm doing this is me doing it this is what i believe in this is what i look like when i believe in it and now it's like i'm doing what i believe in i'm really enjoy it but it's not like here watch me do a set of 20 heavy leg press I'm not like planting a flag. It's me working hard, but it's just different than me pulling 365 for five. And so it's like my training is very grounded in wanting to build muscle and be able to feel good in my body and feel good in life. And I think because I'm just not waging some war that it's like, I don't know. That's just something that's been on my mind. I mean, I don't have near the following that you do nor desire to grow a following but my intention is really to share what i'm doing for my clients because i know they follow me so i don't really feel like i'm posting anything to be planting a flag but for people to see what i'm doing to me it's that i keep doing it i have not stopped for years right no matter what's happening i don't know if people see that or take that away from me posting my workout, regardless of whether it's interesting or not, my training is boring as heck. I'm not doing anything cool. I'm not lifting anything really significantly heavy. Well, it helps that you but I just keep notate doing your weights in kilograms because we have no idea what that actually weighs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do both. You should just drop the pounds. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but but to me, it's important that my the clients, yeah, keep showing up, keep training, even if the numbers aren't impressive or my back hurts or my knees hurt or I'm traveling, moving, or I'm changing scene, scenario. Right. Anyways, I think there are probably people out there that would be interested in what you're doing, even if it's not some plant your flag in the social media world about doing one particular thing. And I'm not really interested in growing my Instagram, but I'm interested in helping people. So yeah, it's kind of figuring out how to But you're probably doing what more people want to be doing. It's great. I love what I'm doing. I'm like having the best time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, might be, I don't know. I'm biased, but <laughs> I would say that's a message to put out there. Yeah. Here's my question to you. What is a hard truth that you learned in 2023? Tough question to put me on the spot about. It is. <laughs> Maybe I can come up with a different one. <laughs> Very existential. What's something you've changed your mind on over the last year? Didn't I already talk about the emotional connection thing? No. Well, probably a combination of both of those hard truths and change my perspective on is how people actually communicate with each other. This was great. <laughs> <laughs> Which when I explained this to my 13-year-old daughter, she looked at me and kind of laughed and was like, you didn't know that <laughs> before? Well, this is news to me. <laughs> Which is that... If what appears to me is that in communicating with people, the Rosetta Stone of communication is really emotion. And yes, intellectual ideas are good to talk about. And, and I'm not saying that 
talking about ideas is not a form of communication or part of communicating, but when somebody is expressing themselves to you or trying to communicate with me, I have found that paying attention to and listening to the emotion that they're expressing in many cases has more weight and importance than the words themselves or the facts that they are expressing. You know, if somebody's expressing frustration, a good response is not to challenge the details of the frustration and to debate whether it's worth being frustrated. <laughs> you, know. you can't win that conversation. Nope, nope not going to go well. <laughs> it's much more effective to acknowledge and maybe even reflect back the emotion that you're perceiving and for that person to feel heard. Yeah. And then from that point, you might be able to effectively move forward. I consider myself an emotionally intelligent person. I mean, I'm very aware of emotions, but for some reason, when it comes to communication, I tend to get very Spock-like when I'm talking to other people and try to dissect, kind of like reverse engineer reality based on thinking that there's some objective truth that we can mm. agree on. There's an outcome that you want. Yeah, and yeah. That, that's just very rarely going to happen. A lot of this came from listening to a bunch of Chris Voss podcasts and how much he talks about tactical empathy. And then actually another part, what really clicked for me was talking to Matt about storytelling. And I asked Matt, we were just doing a call and it's like, cause he's a pretty good storyteller. And I asked him like, what are you doing when you're telling a story? And he's like, well, I tell people how I feel or how I felt and then what I did and then how I felt after I did the thing. And I was like, light bulb went off yeah. like talked about your feelings <laughs> it's like oh yeah because nobody can know what that objective circumstance was like unless we were there in the room together but even then you might perceive it different but everybody can relate to the emotion like it's the universal that's what i mean by the rosetta stone it's yeah like the universal feel sadness, truth feel despair feel yes, joy yes yeah. so you, everybody can relate to that and then the details of the story are what's interesting and, you know, the journey and kind of helps you like paint the picture in your mind. But the thing that really connects you to the other person is the shared emotional context. Anyways. I love that. Barbell logic. Let's talk about that. Barbell Bar logic. Barbell emotion. Emo <laughs> version. <laughs> but how does this relate to being a coach or barbell training? I pay a lot of attention or much more attention to what my client is experiencing emotionally because I think that enables me to communicate better Absolutely. with them, which again... And they want to feel seen by you. Most people listening to this are probably like, really, Andrew? If they're still listening. 45. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Took you 45 years to figure that out. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts and your questions. Thank you for submitting all of your questions. Everybody, it was tough to pick just those three. But we hope you had a wonderful 2024. We'll see you on the other side. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.